Hey everybody, and welcome to the third class of the Pi Pico uh, Deep Dive course. Um, as usual, I will start by sharing my screen and... Uh, okay, so cool. So uh, that was class two, that was last week. Now we are in class three. And just like last time, we have the agenda and we are uh, going to go over those subjects. So you have it here for your... Uh, reference and I will add the resources here as we go and just like last time it's going to be a bit intense we have a lot to cover um, so let's uh, go right into this so the first thing uh, just a very quick review of what we did last week uh, or the last thing we did last week, uh, we, we started working on uh, AVR assembly and uh, we learned about uh, a few basic instructions, uh, move and all these uh, arithmetic and bitwise instructions. Uh, I added the list here so uh, you can see it here. And we also talked about those registers uh, R1 to R12, which is are just like local variables. And we have seen this like cool um, emulator shortcut where you can uh, just uh, dump the values of those registers in your uh, browser console using this BKPT42. So a cool debugging tools tool we can use for uh, studying assembly. All right. So, um, other than uh, those uh, instructions, uh, we also have like uh, bit shift instructions. So uh, we can uh, shift uh, stuff like, uh, uh, so uh, for instance, we can uh, shift uh, R0 by, uh, so uh, logical shift left, uh, left LSL would uh, shift those, um, this value by eight bits. Uh, uh, yeah, eight bits. Let's run it and see. And we will be able to see that uh, R0 is uh, like it's this too, but it's shifted uh, two places to the left. So that's eight bit shift. And similarly, we have um, LSR, which is uh, if we shift it by eight, then it will uh, be zero, but we can shift uh, by one. And that would be uh, just uh, one you can see here. And there is uh, also like uh, rotate right, ROR. So if we rotate right by eight bits, it will, let's remove this comment, it's no longer relevant. So uh, yeah, it fails. Uh, yeah, we can't rotate uh, by a given amount, that's my bad, but we can have the amount of bits to rotate in a register. So. Uh, if we wanted to rotate uh, this one by eight bits, then we would uh, just uh, use this uh, piece of code. And then you can see that this two form uh, that uh, we had here moved here. And this is super useful because um, when you are using this uh, move instruction, you can't really load values that are greater than uh, 255. Like if I try to load 1000, for instance, then you will see I get an error. Uh, this uh, value is out of range, uh, 1000. So if I want to get larger values, uh, the best way to do it is just by uh, loading a smaller value and then I can shift it and uh, I can load another value and bitwise or so I can sort of uh, build the value uh, from uh, smaller values depending on the exact value. Uh, and we'll see another way to load um, uh, 32-bit value into a register uh, soon. Um, one more thing, there is also ASR, which is arithmetic shift right, and it's uh, very simple, similar to um, to LSR. So LSR just both shift the bits right, but ASR uh, is copying the uh, leftmost bits when it shifts bit in. So if the leftmost bit was zero, it will be the same as uh, LSR. LSR always uh, shifts zero from, uh, uh, sorry, RSR. So uh, RSR always shifts zero into the uh, left bits. And then uh, ASR just copies the left bit, leftmost. Uh, that's the MSB when shifting. Um, so we could see the difference if we loaded uh, this value. Uh, we, we, we want to load this into R0, so uh, this value. Um, but obviously it's, yeah, 
uh, we can't load it because it's too big, but we can load this value and then uh, shift it first by, I uh, think uh, we can shift it by 24, if I'm not mistaken, let's see. And then we can uh, see the difference uh, when we shift it with uh, RSR versus, uh, yeah, yeah, RSR uh, by uh, uh, eight, for instance, versus, um, yeah, well, what doesn't it? Oh, we need uh, here uh, this pound sign. Uh, yeah, oh, sorry. Uh, ASR, not RSR, uh, arithmetic shift. So that would shift once. Yeah. Uh, moment, BKPT42. So we can see if, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I think we shifted too much. We needed to shift by probably 20 to get it right. Um, or, yeah, wait a second, we'll figure this one out. Um, uh, da, 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 da. And then, why, oh, that's not 80 hexa, that's the problem. So yeah, I want to load 80 hexa, and then I want to uh, shift it by, uh, I think, uh, 20 is the 24 is the right one to get it like to be this and again I forgot this hashtag um, okay cool uh, run it again yeah so now I got this uh, value in R4 using those two instructions and now you can see that if I shift it with ASR we get uh, F so it uh, adds once on the left because the leftmost bit is one. But if I use a uh, logical shift right LSR, it will shift um, zero. So uh, you can see this is like the output, it's just zero, zero, eight. So that's the difference between ASR arithmetic and logical uh, right shift, shift right. Okay, so that was it with the arithmetic instructions. Um, and uh, one more thing I wanted to mention, and I think uh, I'm not sure if I mentioned it last week, uh, ARM has two uh, encodings for the instruction set. There is like uh, thumb encoding and ARM encoding. And of course it's confusing. So uh, there is this uh, stack overflow answer that explains it all. But uh, what you need to remember is that uh, with uh, the Cortex-M, the uh, mobile, uh, the, the microprocessor uh, version of the ARM, uh, we are all only using the thumb encoding. So the ARM encoding isn't relevant. Let me just uh, put this link here. I think we had it also last time, but uh, yeah. So uh, if you encounter like those uh, terms, you can now uh, know that uh, thumb is just one of the encodings for the instructions. It's a 60 bit encoding. Some instructions are also encoded as 32 bits. Um, and ARM is another encoding, which is not used in this microprocessor. Cool. And um, the next thing I want to show you, so we, we, we talked about those registers R2 to, through uh, R0 through R12. And I want to talk to you another, about another important register that's uh, PC. PC is the program counter. And you can see that I have uh, two, um, uh, consecutive uh, BKPT instructions. So you can see uh, PC is incremented by two. So the size of each uh, BKPT instruction is two bytes and PC is just pointing to the address of the next instruction or depending on the context, it might point to the instruction after the next instruction. But uh, what I want you to see here is how it increments whenever I have uh, more instructions. So. Uh, if I have those four, then you will see it, uh, it jumps uh, four times. So from here uh, until here. So um, that's the PC register. And um, once we know that uh, 
uh, there is a register that points to the next instruction, uh, we can ask ourselves, okay, what can we do with it? So the first thing we can do with it, we can uh, give it a different value. So instead of like uh, pointing to the next instruction, for instance, we can go tell it, uh, you know what, we want you to change the program counter uh, to go back. For instance, uh, let, uh, let's do this example. So uh, I can tell it to, so B is branch. It tells it to set a new value to the uh, PC. And uh, I will define a label. Let's call it uh, uh, eternity. And then I can tell uh, the assembler to uh, branch to eternity. So uh, it will set PC to uh, that the address of the, that same instruction. And then uh, the nice thing about it is that uh, if we run it, we basically created an infinite loop. So it will never get to this uh, BKPT because uh, you can see the simulation is running, but uh, we are just uh, going, uh, going in circles. And um, that's not very useful, um, but it starts to become useful if um, we want to, for instance, create some uh, some logics to create, start creating some uh, control flow. Um, and for that, we need a way to, to do things. For instance, um, first of all, uh, before we do that, uh, I can show you another nice demo. So uh, we can actually, instead of going uh, back just uh, one instruction, let's uh, get rid of this, we don't need it right now. So instead of going back one instruction, we can actually branch back to setup. So uh, now we can uh, serial print land hello, and then delay 1000. And uh, yeah, now we do need a simulation to see the output. And um, oh, that's serial one, of course. I, would, I told you I would fall for that. And now at this point, we basically created a, a infinite loop, but it does something in this loop. It just uh, prints a low and then it goes back to the beginning of setup. Um, so that's already useful in a way, but if we want it to be really useful, then we need to support some way of uh, setting a conditional jump, conditional branch. So instead of always going to setup, let's say we only want to do something uh, 10 times and for that, we have um, a set of instructions called conditional branches. And those conditional branches, um, they, 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 uh, they work by looking at uh, some uh, CPU flags. So those flags are basically, uh, they are like uh, four flags. Uh, I think the most useful one is the zero flag, uh, which tell you if the result of the last calculation was uh, zero. And let's see how it works. And then we'll see how to combine it with the uh, conditional branches. So for instance, if I'm, uh, I have the value um, zero in R zero, and then I'm adding there uh, at R zero, five, then obviously the result won't be zero. And uh, if we take a look at the flags, uh, which should uh, appear in the console, you can see these are the flags and uh, the, the, all of them are right now grayed out. It means that none of these flags are set, but if we uh, add zero to our zero, which means the result will be zero, we can see that uh, now the zero flag is on. So basically that means that uh, the result is now uh, zero. And this can be useful because um, uh, if we like have uh, one in R1 and then we subtract one from uh, in R0 and then we sub subtract one from it, we can check if the result is zero. You can see that now we have uh, this zero flag set. And um, we can take advantage of that by uh, initializing, for instance, R0 to 10. And then every time we are going to uh, subtract one, and then uh, if it's, and then like print the result, and then we want to go back only if R0 isn't zero. So uh, for that, we are going to use a conditional branch. Let's define a label here. Uh, let's call it uh, 
we, we can actually uh, just go back to the beginning of, no, let's go back here. Uh, let's uh, call it label one, uh, just uh, uh, one name. And um, the thing I'm going to do now is show you this uh, conditional execution. It's uh, in the ARM v6 architecture reference manual that uh, I shared the link last time. And it shows you all these uh, uh, conditional branches. And they always start with the B plus some uh, plus two letters that specify the type of condition. So for instance, I want to, uh, if I want to branch um, based on the zero flag, I write BEQ branch equal, and then uh, it will branch if the zero flag is, um, is set to one. And I can use B and E, which will branch if the zero flag is set to zero. So in this example, I could just branch equals. So that would uh, be uh, branch if um, our, uh, if zero is true and go back to label one. And now when I run this demo, I should see the loop running. Uh, yeah, why did I mess up? Uh, oh, yeah, it doesn't like this form of comment probably. And now you should be seeing yeah, interesting. Um, oh yeah, sorry. I want to branch if zero is false. So uh, I want to branch as long as the result is not zero. So instead of using B and Q, I actually want to use B and E if zero is not set. So now I will probably get the correct result. Um, and yeah, you can see that we have like uh, a, a, a R0 going, um, Interesting. Oh yeah, my bad. Uh, I create an infinite loop. Uh, and now you can see like uh, my browser is struggling. Let's uh, close this. So yeah, I should have uh, initialized R0 outside a loop. Um, let's retry that. I think I may have to, uh, yeah, open a new window. If that doesn't work, let's try that again now. Uh, initializing R0. Yeah, okay, so now I got the correct result. You can see R0 is going down, uh, four, three, two, one. And after it's zero, uh, this, uh, you can see that, that in all those uh, cases, the zero flag is not set. And then uh, the zero flag is set um, here when uh, it, it reaches zero and uh, the branch is not taken and we finish this loop. So that's a very simple uh, for loop that goes from, uh, from uh, 10 to zero or from nine to one, depend on when you sample the value of R zero. In our case, it goes from uh, nine to one because uh, we sample it here. And what if we wanted to do the opposite? For instance, uh, counting from, uh, zero or from one to 10. So obviously we could have uh, done this, like adding uh, one to R zero, but then how would we write the branch? So uh, one way to do it is just uh, to do something like subtracting 10 from R zero. And if R zero is equal 10, then the result will be equal to 10. Uh, the, the result will be equal to zero and zero will be true. And uh, we won't uh, go back. We won't uh, continue looping, but then we will also lose the value of R10. So there is another instruction called, called CMP, which is compare, which basically does uh, R0 minus 10 and then only updates the flag. So this is like, uh, like sub, uh, but doesn't, but throws away the result. And then that's uh, another way we can uh, do this. So we can see now that R0 goes uh, from one uh, in the first invocation and then two, three, four, five. And you can see that all those flags are gray until we get, um, yeah, until we get to this. Oh yeah, we need to call uh, BKPT after the inst instruction to see the uh, flags uh, after this comparison and before the branch. So yeah, so now we can see that uh, for all those invocations, uh, 
at the, before the loop, uh, when r is zero is less than 10, uh, we can see that only the n, n is the negative flag, negative flag. Uh, so the only the n flag is set. And that's because uh, five or in this case, three minus 10 is negative. So uh, the negative flag is set. And then as soon as uh, we eat 10, the zero flag is set and also the carry flag is set because uh, in subtraction, the carry is set if uh, the, the second operand is uh, uh, less than or equal to the first operand. Um, and you don't have to really remember all those rules because there is like this uh, very useful table uh, which said, uh, which explains uh, in which case, uh, like uh, if uh, it's sign are greater than or equal, signed less than, uh, unsigned, uh, higher, lower, same. It explains uh, when comparing uh, two values, uh, uh, R0 and 10 or two registers, uh, when do we take the, the, the branch? So uh, in this case, we take it if they are equal, in this case, if they are not equal. Um, and then um, if uh, the, the left one is higher, um, if we look at them as unsigned, then uh, we, we will use, if we want to test for this condition, we'll use this uh, be high, etc. So you have this uh, very useful table. Um, it's uh, in A63, there is also like a reference here, so you can know uh, where it is. Um, cool, so uh, we already know how to sort of uh, implement a basic control flow. Uh, we can implement uh, loops this way, um, but what if we actually want to um, call functions? And you know what, before we do that, I want to show you one more thing about those uh, branches. Um, so uh, let's say I didn't want to, uh, I, I wasn't very creative and I just gave it this uh, loop name and I would try to run the code and oops, it fails. It says loop is already defined. So that's one thing you should know. Whenever you uh, define some label here, it's actually uh, globally defined for the entire file. And in this case, it collides with the uh, loop definition. So there is a nice way to sort of use uh, local labels. So you don't have to worry about those collisions. Um, I mean, you could probably use a convention of using something like that uh, for um, inner labels inside functions, but uh, there is a nice shortcut. You can just give them numbers uh, like uh, number one. And then when you branch, you can tell, uh, go to number one, and then you need to tell it where to look for it. So B means uh, look backwards, look for the, uh, the closest label one that uh, is uh, before this instruction. And then you also have one F which tells it to look down. So usually when you write your own assembly code, it's just, uh, I think it's the best practice to use um, a number for the numbers for the labels and then just one B or one F or any number BF or F to look for them. And if I'm not mistaken, you can use any number from uh, one to nine. And if you have like uh, multiple ones, it will just look for, uh, let's do this actually, it will just go to the closest one uh, looking backward. So even though I defined one multiple times, this still works and uh, you can see like uh, this from the previous execution, but you can see uh, I got the correct result. The loop executed 10 times. It didn't go here, it went here. So that's how you define uh, uh, really local labels in assembly. Okay, so um, now we want to, uh, to have the ability to call uh, functions. And um, one way to do that, um, if we wanted to, uh, to, to, to know how function call work, would be to try to define our own function. Let's call it, uh, for instance, uh, my function. And then uh, try to call it from assembly, for instance. So uh, we can have, yeah, so... Uh, Yeah, that multi-line assembly. I don't know why I deleted it and uh, we still need it. So yeah, so um, yeah. 
now the syntax is correct. Uh, so one way to do this uh, would just be, you know, to branch to my function. Uh, that, that would work like any other branch. Um, and then in this function, I can do uh, serial dot, uh, uh, I can actually just print the registers for, for, for a beginning. So uh, I will do that. And uh, I mean, why did it fail? Oh, yeah. The reason it failed is that uh, my function is actually a C++ function, so uh, its name is changed. It's called ma name mangling, and I can avoid that by using this uh, extern C syntax. It just tells the compiler to call it uh, my function without any uh, name decorations. And uh, you can read more about name mangling here uh, if you're interested. And if you want, uh, I can uh, talk more about that in the uh, Q&A session. But for now, all you need to remember is if you define a function that you want to call from assembly, it's probably the best to just define it with this uh, extrinsic prefix. Um, Cool, so uh, bkpt42. And now we have a function that calls another function and we can see that um, the uh, registers have changed. And um, in uh, I can also call it here from C and then it should be invoked twice. Um, and what I want you to see now, or what I want us to uh, explore together, is how we um, how we find the values of the arguments for this function. So, for instance, we can uh, we can pass here fifteen, and let's see what happens inside this function. So, yeah, uh, yeah, we just need to say here that it takes a number. Otherwise, that wouldn't probably work. And uh, yeah, so uh, if we were looking for this 15, um, the, the truth is uh, you could go for hours looking for this 15, but you would never find it. And the reason for that is that this function isn't actually uh, created as a function. Instead, what happens is that the compiler inlines this function. So it basically copies this code here and here, and it ignores this number because nobody is using this number. Um, I could probably try to uh, trick the compiler. And uh, I don't know, maybe if I have like uh, a serial print there and just you know print the number, that would work. Let's try that. Not sure, but it's... It's worth trying that to see if that would, uh, hello, yeah, if that would uh, fix this uh, issue where the, the function is inlined. And uh, actually it did. Uh, I, I can also print this uh, number here. So we will see what happens when we call it from assembly. So uh, let's do that again. And you will now observe that uh, it prints this value 15. And then when we call it from assembly, it prints this value four. So it's as if it was called with four as an argument. And if we now look at the registers, we can see where this argument is coming from. In the first invocation, it R0 had a value of F and in the second invocation, it had a value of four. So basically um, we, we, we can guess that uh, I mean, R1 also had these values. So we can guess it's either R0 or R1, which holds the value of the argument. And what we can do is just test uh, which one is the right one. So for instance, if we uh, uh, set R0 to 22 before calling this function, then we will see uh, something interesting. We will see that uh, it now prints 22. So basically, the way to pass arguments to functions is just to put them in, uh, to put the, the argument, the value of the argument in R0. So that's how uh, we, uh, um, yeah, um, how we pass values to functions. And I want to show you uh, something else. Now, uh, what if we want to call this function again? I mean, this function, uh, it's a function, so uh, it's supposed to somehow uh, be able to return, 
But right now, if we call it again, like with 33, you will see that it's not called again. Something happens. This function doesn't return. And the reason it doesn't return is that we didn't tell it where to return. And uh, to show you that, I'm going to add another uh, breakpoint here just uh, before calling it from, uh, from assembly. So that would be the second print. And I want you to notice something. So we have this PC, which is the uh, program counter. And um, you can see that uh, PC in this uh, second time is set to this value. And then um, when we go to the function, so this the second PKPD inside a function, we can see that the PC is set to a different value, a little bit lower by about 20 exa. And um, the thing is, uh, the, the function, when it returns, it needs to know where it should return. And it uses another register for that. So there is this uh, LR link register, which tells the function where to return. And right now, when we are doing this branch, we are not setting this link register. So the function, uh, instead of returning to uh, the address after uh, this one, uh, to the next uh, instruction, it just returns here which is probably where uh, setup should return. And we can fix that by doing, instead of using B, we can use uh, BL, which is branch link. It means uh, jump to this function and also update this LR link register with the uh, value with the return address of the function. So that would be uh, the, the PC of the address of this uh, next instruction. And now if we uh, comment this out for a moment, so we don't get too many debug prints, you will see that now uh, after the, uh, um, the uh, in the second invocation, so the third uh, debug print that comes from here, you can see that LR is set to be a bit after uh, this PC. So about a bit after this point. Actually, uh, if I change my uh, print to be here, you will see that LR points at this instruction. So uh, this print now goes here. So you can see this is the um, LR, the link register where um, uh, this function will return. And you can see that uh, the PC, this is actually the value of PC after the PKPT. It's just uh, this one plus one. So uh, the 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 LR always have the has the uh, least significant bit set, and that that has to do with uh, the fact we are running uh, in the thumb mode. Uh, but you shouldn't care about it too much. What you need to remember is that other than this uh, least significant bit, it just points always points to the uh, address of that instruction, the instruction uh, next to the BL. Um, and now we can probably, uh, you know, do this one more time, just uh, BL to my function. And uh, yeah, now we can see that uh, it, it executed three times correctly. If we run it again with the debug prints, you can also see like those register values. Um, so yeah, so basically BL is how we call functions and um, then uh, we'll see in a moment how we uh, return from functions. Right now, the compiler is doing it for us. Um, but uh, what I wanted you to know is that, uh, or what I wanted to show you is how we uh, sort of figure out ourselves uh, which way the parameters are passed. And uh, R0 is indeed how we pass parameters. And we could go on and like add more parameters and try to figure that out. But the truth is there is like this, um, yeah, this uh, procedure called standard from the ARM architecture. I will just put a link in the document so you'll also have it. Uh, and this document basically defines how uh, function calls work in this uh, architecture. So there is like the standard base procedure call, the base procedure call standard. And it has this section about the registers and then it tells you what, what each register does inside a function. So for instance, you can see that R0 to R3 are used to pass arguments. R0 to R1 are used for the result. So that's the return function, a value of the function. And then there are also scratch registers, which means that uh, the function can modify their values without preserving them. Um, 
But then there are like all those registers, which are variable registers. And this means that uh, when you write a function, you can uh, use these uh, registers to store values and you can be sure that any function that you call won't uh, modify them. Or if it modifies them, it will preserve the value. So uh, uh, if you call another function and it modifies R8, uh, you don't see it. it. It has to restore the value of R8 at the end. So these are like uh, all those uh, registers from uh, R4 to R11 are variable registers. Uh, they, they, are, um, they are guaranteed to be preserved when you call a function, unlike uh, those four registers, which may change. And you also use them to uh, pass arguments and their return values. Um, and uh, then there is uh, like this R12, which is also scratch register. So you can modify it as you like. Uh, it's not guaranteed to be preserved uh, inside uh, functions. Um, and uh, somebody is asking if BL is similar to call in x86 assembly. So it's similar in the way, in a way, it doesn't do anything with the stack. And we'll talk about the stack in a second. So it just, uh, uh, BL just copies uh, the value of PC after the instruction uh, of the next instruction into link register and then just uh, assigns the address of my function to PC. Um, so that's about the register. So we already know there are like those registers where we uh, pass the arguments and the result. And you probably ask yourself what happens if we have uh, more than like uh, four arguments or we have very big arguments. And for that, we have like um, a, a bunch of um, algorithms that explain how um, how this works. So for instance, uh, let's start with the return value because it's a bit simpler. It says that uh, there is like an algorithm that says, uh, for instance, um, a data type that is smaller than four bytes is zero or sign extended and return in R0. And then if it's a word size, so four bytes, then it's returned in R0. And if it's a double four word size, like a long double, uh, Etc. it returns in those two registers. And then it goes on. Um, and then for parameter passing, there is a very, very long algorithm that uh, you can read if you like. Uh, it's pretty boring. Uh, in a nutshell, uh, what it says, uh, you basically pass the, uh, the, the arguments um, in those uh, registers, R0 to R4, R3. And then when you are out of registers, you use the stack for the remaining registers, uh, for the remaining uh, arguments. And um, we, we, we will talk about the stack in a moment. But uh, for the most part, those registers should suffice for uh, most use cases. Um, so um, one more thing we uh, can take a look at here is this subroutine calls. So uh, th this just explains how, uh, how uh, wh what we have just seen here, how this BL works and that it sets the, uh, the, the copies, the return address into LR. And this is like uh, sort of like uh, how to implement uh, your own, um, your own uh, variant uh, of BL. Um, Anyway, this is just, uh, if you want to know more, you can look into this document. It's very detailed. I think too much too detailed, but for the most part, you just need to remember there is like BL and then um, there is like uh, R0 for the arguments, also for the return value. And um, what we are going to do now, instead of uh, implementing this function in C, we're going to do it in pure assembly. So let's change it to max32 and move the implementation out of this file. So uh, num1, num2, we want to create a function and it returns an int, a function that will uh, take two numbers and return the maximum. Uh, so let's start by uh, writing the tests for this function. So uh, max 32, let's say S or 10 and 15 and 15 and 10. And we expect both to be uh, 15. 
So uh, how do we do this? The first thing we do uh, is just create a new file. Let's call it hackaday.s, that's assembly source file. And now we are going to define this function on our own without any help from the compiler. So that's the max32. And we know the args are in r0 and r1 and the return value should be in r0. So the first thing we need to do uh, before we even uh, implement the logic is just uh, to return. And returning in uh, assembly is super simple. We just bx, bx is branch uh, from, uh, and read the address through, uh, for the branch from a register, lr. Basically, this, uh, this is the equivalent of move PC LR. It just copies the uh, address of um, uh, the address, the return address that we have in LR into PC, and that how, that's how we return from functions. And now uh, uh, that we have this return, uh, basically, if we don't do anything, uh, if we just run, it won't compile. It says, uh, yeah, that's, yeah, that's not a valid comment. Uh, yeah, but it won't compile because uh, it doesn't know uh, about uh, Mac 32. It says like this symbol is uh, not defined. And that's because we didn't say it's global. So in assembly code, we should, everything is local to the file by default. If you want to export any kind of symbol, we need to make it uh, global. So um, making it global and then uh, now when we run it, we can see it compiles but it still doesn't do what it's supposed to do. It just returns the first argument. And that's because uh, the return value is always expected in R0. So uh, in order to fix that, let's implement some logic. We are going to compare R0 with uh, R1. So that's the uh, CMP instruction. And by the way, the syntax highlighting still uh, doesn't work very well uh, in, uh, in this uh, editor, but. I'm working on it, probably should work better for next week. And then uh, after we compare them, uh, I want to, uh, if, R1, if R0, let's say we want to do it unsigned. So I will consign the table. So if R0 is higher, so B high, um, if R0 is high, higher than R1, then I want to just uh, go to, uh, so if it's higher, then I go to label number uh, one uh, forward. So that will be returning. Otherwise, I just, uh, if our zero is not higher than a high one, R1, I just copy uh, the value from R1 to R0. So it will return the higher value. Let's run it and see if it works. Um, hopefully so. And yeah, now you can see it always returns the higher value. Let's just uh, copy this uh, and I will probably uh, organize this later. But for now you have this uh, code example here. And um, so that's cool. Now we know how to implement, to write functions in assembly. But um, yeah, there is a great question on the chat. What happens if I want to use the other registers like R4 and R5? And for that, we are going to implement another function in assembly. Uh, and you probably know this function, it's the Fibonacci function. And with the Fibonacci, we are going to um, have like uh, n, and it will return the n number in the Fibonacci sequence. And let's create some test code. I goes from zero to 16 and a serial, or let's just use printf because it's more convenient in this case. Uh, that's not standard Arduino, but we can still do this. So I and FIBO I. And just uh, the scaffold for FIBO, let's do it in assembly. So we have this uh, FIBO, global FIBO. And then FIBO is just, uh, if we do just this, just returning, then uh, it will just uh, return the argument and you can see it prints uh, the value that it got. And in order to implement FIBO, we need to do a few things. First of all, we need to uh, check if zero or one, then return. Uh, so if it's zero, return zero, or we can say probably if zero returns zero, same goes for one, uh, else return FIBO of n minus one, 
uh, plus FIBO of n minus two. Uh, so the, the first two conditions are pretty easy. So we can say C and P are zero, zero. And um, then if it's uh, equal, uh, if it's zero, let's define a label here, just go to one F, go to one below and same logic for one. And we already finished that uh, to these two, um, so these two conditions, but now we have to do this. So we need to call FIBO with N minus one. So obviously we could uh, subtract uh, one from R zero and then uh, branch link to uh, FIBO, but then uh, we will have uh, FIBO of N minus one now in R zero, but we, we no longer have this value of R zero. Um, so it would be nice if we could somehow preserve this value. And uh, so we could call FIBO with N minus two. And one way to do it would be just to use one of those uh, higher registers that are uh, guaranteed to be saved across calls. So um, we, we can do something like uh, at the beginning, we could copy this value. So uh, move R4, which is one of the saved registers, R0. And now we could probably uh, assume that uh, like we could move uh, our First of all, we want to save the, the, the return value of FIBO. It's now in R0, so we don't want to override it. So we can, let's say, save it inside R5. And now um, we, we, we can restore uh, the uh, argument from uh, R4 and we can uh, subtract two. So uh, from the result and now branch link to FIBO. And now we have the result for, uh, let's so that's FIBO n minus one. And the other one is FIBO n minus two. Cool. And now we have the, uh, the result in R zero. So we can end the previous result in R five and we can uh, add R five uh, R5, R0, R5. So now R0 is just uh, uh, just the result of uh, uh, FIBO. It's actually FIBO n minus uh, two plus FIBO n minus one. And yeah, that would hopefully work. But as you can probably see in a moment, it doesn't really never, it never finishes running. We just, we, we get, we never guessed past one. And the reason for that is um, th those registers aren't saved automatically for us. We have to take care of that. So when we write a function, if we do something like this, if we modify any of those registers uh, other than R0 to R3 or R12, we need to save them. And the easiest way would be to save them to the stack. And uh, the, the stack is basically, there is another uh, register called uh, the stack pointer. I will uh, probably print it in a moment, but for now, bear with me. We are just going to push uh, those value R4 and R5. So here we are saving them to the stack. And before returning, we are popping them from the stack. Uh, and you would imagine that would probably fix the issue, but there is another thing. It still doesn't work. And the reason it is still doesn't work and we get all those uh, errors in the console is that um, when we call uh, BL FIBO again, we also override the link register. So whenever we call another function in our code, we also need to store the link register. So uh, we can also push it and now we can probably uh, pop it but this instruction actually doesn't exist in uh, the, the instruction set of the PyPico. Uh, there is a reason for that. Usually you don't really want to um, pop LR and uh, I mean, usually when you want to restore LR is just because you want to return. So do this next. So you could obviously do something like uh, pop R6 and then uh, it would override R6, so that would be another problem. But there is a nice shortcut. You can just pop directly into PC, and then you don't have to do uh, uh, this uh, BXLR. 
So basically, whenever we enter this function, we push R4, R5, and LR into the stack. And then at the end, we restore them. And instead of restoring LR, we just uh, you know, copy the value to PC because that's what we care about. And now if we run the code, this will hopefully give us the Fibonacci sequence. Yes, you can see now it works. So uh, this is a good example of how to use the stack to store um, to store these registers and the call save registers versus those uh, scratch registers that you don't need to care about. And let's edit here and later I will organize it more nicely. Um, but uh, Justin is asking whether I don't have to, okay, I think our experiments kill this uh, small console whether I don't have to uh, pop in the opposite order of pushing. And yeah, that's true. The stack is like always uh, pushing, it's going to build down. So whenever I push uh, the stack pointer uh, goes uh, uh, one, one way lower. Let's actually uh, demonstrate that real quick. So uh, let's ditch the FIBO for a moment and just open uh, an assembly section. And now I can just pick APT. Um, and then I can uh, push R0, uh, move R0 55. Now let's print the registers again, and then I can pop R0 and do this one again. And now you should be, uh, what did I mess up? Missing semicolon. And now you should be seeing how the stack works. So uh, you can see how R0 has this value that comes from somewhere. And then um, when I, after I pushed R0, uh, you can see, uh, and I set it to a different value, you can see it's actually, let's do it in hexa so it will be easier to see that. But uh, you can see that uh, it changes the value. And when I popped it, it restored the original value. But the more interesting thing is that we have this SP, that's this tag pointer. And you can see that here it's, it has this 660, but when I uh, push the value, it got uh, two, uh, four places lower. So it pushed uh, four bytes and now it, uh, it went uh, four places back. We can actually see that if we uh, just subtract those two numbers, we can see it's four. And then um, when I pop, you can see SP goes back to the original value. So that's how the, uh, the uh, push and pop work. And internally, the implementation, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, you can see it in the data sheet, like uh, how it pops and pushes in which order, but it does it in the reverse order. So uh, they don't get mixed up. So if we go to the alphabetical list and we take a look at pop, uh, yeah, we can see that in pop, it just goes from zero to seven and then it stores this in, uh, or that's, it loads it from uh, the memory address um, um, at address and yeah. And where does, uh, where is the push, push. So, uh, yeah, actually here it increments the address uh, and then in pop, uh, it probably, uh, da, 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 da. yeah, it also increments the address. Uh, yeah, so uh, it's basically, uh, so it just uh, in, in push, what happens is it first of all uh, goes SP and goes back. So uh, it, it, if you push four registers, it goes back uh, four entries, 16 bytes, and then it loads the registers from there. And in pop, uh, what happens, it just uh, uh, loads the registers from the current stack pointer and advances it in four at a time. So basically uh, it's uh, doing, um, doing this is more or less the equivalent of doing, uh, let's write it in a comment. So this is basically uh, the equivalent of equals push R4, uh, push R5, push LR, and then pop LR, pop R4, pop R5.
R4, R5 and R4. So yeah, so I hope this uh, answers the uh, uh, number. Um, yeah, so uh, yeah, puppy C, right? That's that's correct. So yeah, so um, that was about push and pop. And I see there are a few questions in the chat. So uh, we, we can get to them in the Q&A session because uh, before we finish, I want to show you uh, one or two more things. So uh, right now we only work with registers and we know we can use push and pop to save them to the stack. So uh, we can use them as local variables. But what happens when we want to uh, use something like a global variable? So um, in that case, uh, we have some work we need to do. First of all, there are like uh, instructions that can help we, with that. There are like uh, uh, two instructions, uh, LDM and uh, STM. So uh, LDR and STR, load and uh, store register. And uh, to demonstrate that, these instructions, I'm going to create another function. Let's call it counter. And counter is just going to uh, have a global variable, a global value that it increments every time uh, you call it. So uh, the first thing we want to do is just, uh, of course, uh, return from counter. And let's also define it here. Uh, just, you know, uh, counter that gets an N. Oh, it doesn't get anything, but it still returns an int. And then uh, we can have this, um, uh, let's say just uh, we print here, instead of printing I, we are just printing uh, the value of counter, which should increment by one every time. Yeah, we can probably ditch this. All right. And uh, obviously now uh, if we run it, uh, I don't know what will happen. It will probably print some random values. Yeah, always these values and then uh, always two for some reason. Uh, but we want it to uh, store some state and increment it. And for that, we would need to declare a variable. And a variable is just a label. So uh, counter var, and we are we want to put there the value zero. And um, the thing is, if we declare the variable like this, then um, it's declared inside the code section and we won't be able to write to it. If we want to tell the compiler that this is actually data, we need to write uh, dot data and uh, then dot text to return back to the code. So this, the, the, this uh, counter is put into the code section and not data section and not into the RAM. This, this goes into the flash, this goes into the RAM. So uh, ideally we would want to uh, load something from counter var and um, then increment that value, save it and return it. But the thing is, uh, the address of counter var is probably too big to load into a register. So we can do something like that, like move the, the, the address of counter var into R0 because it's too big. So there is a trick uh, that uh, we do. We can define another label, let's call it uh, one. And in this label, we have, we store the address of uh, counter var. So uh, now we have this address and then we can uh, load this value into R0. So we are using this new instruction, LDR R0. And we load um, actually into R1 because we are going to use R0 next. And we are going to load uh, the value from uh, 1F. I think that's the uh, syntax, not sure. We'll figure it out in a moment. And then once we have the address of this uh, variable in R1, we can load uh, the value from there using another LDR instruction. So load R1 from the address pointed by, uh, load R0 from the address pointed by R1, add uh, R01. And finally, we can store uh, the new value of R0, that's the store instruction, into the address pointed by R1. Now, this may compile and may not, let's see. Yeah, the, the problem is that all the load and the store instruction, they need to write to aligned addresses. So addresses that are uh, on the four byte boundary. And this variable just not, doesn't happen to be uh, on such boundary. So we can tell the compiler uh, align four, which tells it, 
uh, make sure the next uh, piece of data is aligned on the four byte pound byte pound byte boundary. So it will just uh, pad it with zero. So this uh, lies on a four byte boundary. And if all works well now, uh, we'll see this counter in action. Yes, you can see it worked. So the, 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 there is a bit of work we need to do to uh, work with variables because we need to sort of, uh, first of all, uh, load their address uh, into a register and then load the value from that address. So that's a two-step thing, but that's the way you work with uh, global variables um, or with the data section. Of course, you can also get the address uh, in one of these parameters. So let's copy this as well and I will later organize it uh, in a, one nice uh, example like we have here from last time. And um, basically uh, these are the basic instructions that you need to know about. There are a few more if you want, to, I can show you them in the Q and A like uh, LDM and STM that are just like LDR and SDR, but they are storing multiple values at once. So you can store like R1 and R2 and it will store them uh, uh, consequent uh, one after each other. Um, and uh, same for STM, we'll uh, store, uh, so LDM will load multiple values, STM will store multiple values. Um, and um, yeah, I think uh, we pretty much covered most of the instruction set already. There are a few missing instructions um, and it's sometimes a bit hard to remember all those instructions. So I really looked hard for like references that can help. And I found this uh, nice uh, reference card that you can use uh, with all the instructions. I will share the link. Uh, where is that in the document? So you will have it as well. You can download it from here. Um, it's not perfect, but I think it's the best reference that I found so far. There is also like this file with all the instructions, but it it it's pretty messy because you have like instructions for uh, ARM v7 and we are using v6m. So there are like many irrelevant instructions. And when you go like, let's go to LDR, where is that LDR? Yeah. When you go to LDR, there are so many of them, but uh, when you go to one of those instructions, you can see like there are like specific notes for uh, like uh, um, um, di different uh, architecture. Uh, I think maybe LDM as, uh, yeah. Yeah, you can see there are like 16 bit instructions is like thumb. So in 60 bit instructions, there are specific registers. I'll copy this one as well, but I think uh, it's, it's probably more confusing because it has, um, yeah, let's make it a link. It has uh, a lot of um, uh, instructions or options for the instructions that aren't available. And this one is more like relevant to our uh, thumb uh, in ARM v6 and not the uh, other uh, more advanced version of the instruction set. And, um, before we move on to the Q&A section, uh, a few pieces of homework that you can use to practice uh, what you learned today in the class and uh, also one, one, uh, one more fun instruction. So, uh, so the, this homework is going to be a part of the final project. You can do it for next week or which is probably a good idea, or you can do it when you start working on the final project and we'll have uh, some more uh, uh, coming in the next few session. Uh, so um, the first thing you need to do is to implement uh, GCD, which is just a greater common, uh, a greatest common uh, divisor. And there is like a few algorithms that you can implement. You probably want to do this implement because this uh, algorithm, because it doesn't include division and there is no instruction to divide uh, numbers. But if you do want to challenge yourself, and uh, let me just share this link with the explanation. If you do want to challenge yourself, there is like, uh, I don't have it open now, but um, there is uh, in the RP2040 data sheet, there is like this uh, system description. 
uh, SAO. There is like a, a hardware the integer uh, divider. It's in here. Yeah, there is somewhere here you can find information. So you can try to like uh, read this. Um, there is like a set of registers that you can use, and then you can try to use this uh, integer divider uh, in the SAO. Uh, let me copy down this section number in case you want to do this with division. Um, that's two, two, three, one, five. So if you want to really uh, uh, shine, then uh, uh, you can also uh, use this integer divider in uh, this section. Uh, otherwise, you can just implement like this algorithm, which uh, doesn't need any division or uh, any remainders uh, and not worry about it too much. And then um, another function I would love you to implement is a function that is called square and it takes an array of numbers uh, as an argument and a second argument is the size of this array, how many uh, numbers we have there. And it just updates all the numbers in this array uh, to their square. So multiplies each number in this array by itself, uh, modifying uh, the, array, the, the array. So that's your homework. And of course you need to implement these functions in ARM assembly. That's the, the idea to practice. Um, cool. So uh, I think with that, we can probably move on to uh, the Q&A. Until then, I hope you have a great week and see you again next, next week where we'll talk about reverse engineering, disassembly, and hopefully some uh, somewhere about uh, multi-core uh, operation on the PyPico.